It all begins with microorganisms called plankton. You can see that they have some individual mobility, but collectively these organisms drift with the currents. Wherever you have high concentrations of organisms in the water, you'll have organic debris falling to the ocean floor. This could include dead bodies and waste of plankton, but could also include waste from organisms that fed on the plankton. Normally, that organic debris is destroyed on the ocean floor by oxygen, bacteria, and scavengers. In some areas, sediments are washed off the nearby land and they mix with that organic debris. Weathering is accompanied by erosionary forces such as water and wind, and these forces sweep away the weathered debris, which exposes the rock underneath to additional weathering so that the process continues. The first sample of rock that we'll examine is a small core of shale. And shale is made primarily from silt and clay, and it's a very tight grained rock. And if we look at it using the magnifier, we can see that the grain structure is very tight. And also, maybe you can observe that there is a bit of a horizontal or laminar structure to this rock as opposed to a uniform structure. Eras are broken down into shorter sections of time called periods. The Earth always stays the same size, so the creation of new crust along these spreading ridges means that crust has to be crumpled or destroyed somewhere else. Crust is destroyed in areas called subduction zones. In subduction zones, a piece of the Earth's crust will slide underneath another piece. The subducted portion will become part of the mantle again and will be recycled over geologic time. This process is called plate tectonics because it's divided the Earth's crust into about a dozen plates. These plates move and change over geologic time, and there's activity along the plate boundaries. Now let's go back in time and see how scientists believe that plate tectonics has changed the Earth's crust. Here we go. If you would like to explore these paleogeographic maps on your own, you can use the forward and reverse buttons to explore any particular time period. The trend to drill into these shale layers directly to produce oil and gas is called unconventional development. I mentioned before that the Cretaceous period was ideal for marine life, and at that time sea levels were high and the Rocky Mountains had not yet been uplifted. Unconformities can occur. These are large time gaps or pattern changes between successive rock layers. These can occur because of erosion, earth forces such as plate tectonics, or long breaks in time where deposition did not occur. Exposed rock at the surface, called outcrops, can provide important information about the type, age, and characteristics of the rock underground. Heat and pressure applied over a long period of time causes kerogen molecules to break down into smaller molecules called hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbon molecules may then break down over time into even smaller hydrocarbon molecules and different sizes of molecules have different characteristics. The molecules are called hydrocarbons because they're composed of hydrogen atoms bonded with carbon atoms. If you look at these molecules at normal temperature, which we'll call 60 degrees Fahrenheit, the top four molecules, which are also the smallest and lightest molecules, are gases. This is methane, ethane, propane, and butane. The gas can then be sent onto a processing plant where the heavier gases and the remaining suspended liquids will be extracted. These are called natural gas liquids, or NGLs. If sedimentation continues, then the weight of new layers will push older layers deeper and deeper into the Earth's crust where they become exposed to more and more of the Earth's heat. If source rock burial continues below the oil window, then only gas will be formed. Initially, it will be wet gas, which is methane, plus heavier gases such as ethane, propane, and butane, plus suspended liquids known as condensate. If the oil and gas is expelled into a layer with improved flow properties, then buoyancy will cause the oil and gas to continue its upward flow in a process called the secondary migration. 
If the oil and gas eventually encounters an impermeable layer that blocks its upward flow, it may travel laterally along the bottom of that layer, and sometimes oil and gas travels long distances away from its original source. Shale is made of tiny silt and clay grains, and as we mentioned before, small grain size has more of an impact on permeability than on porosity, and some shales have a reasonable amount of porosity. However, shales have terrible permeability. The container on the right contains mixed glass shapes that are mostly small, poorly sorted, poorly rounded, and there are many flaky pieces. And these are all characteristics that we've said are unfavorable for reservoir quality rock. Now we'll turn the containers over and observe the permeability or flow characteristics. Another feature required is a migration route from the source rock to the trap structure. And the migration has to occur at the right time because if it happens before the trap structure is created, then the trap won't contain any oil and gas. We can get an impression of the porosity and permeability of these rocks by putting a drop of water on each sample and see what happens. Here's an example of compressional anticlines. As the Earth's crust is compressed, it buckles and uplifts, and elevated portions at the surface will eventually be eroded. Faulting can be caused either by forces that stretch the Earth's crust or compress the Earth's crust. Here's an example where the Earth's crust is stretched and it causes a fault block to slide down and thus causes some impermeable layers to block the oil and gas flow in some porous and permeable layers. Salt is light and has plastic qualities compared to other types of sedimentary rock. So if other sedimentary layers begin to build on top of that salt layer, their heavier weight causes them to want to sink into that salt layer, and they start to do so irregularly. These fanned out sections of sand are formed offshore from river deltas. And we earlier discussed how they form good reservoir rock. Here's the delta of a sediment-rich river depositing sediments offshore. As we look at the scene, we're interested in all of the petroleum system elements. That includes source, maturity, migration, reservoir, trap, and seal. And all of those elements are present. And we're going to look at both conventional traps and unconventional resources in this scene. The only way to make this type of resource profitable is to drill horizontal wells with hydraulic fracturing. The horizontal wells provide more wellbore exposure, and the hydraulic fracturing extends the reach of those wells by providing avenues for oil and gas to escape the rock and travel to the wellbores. The results of unconventional wells are fairly predictable with no dry holes, and initial production is high, so you get back your money fairly soon if oil and gas prices are high enough. Because unconventional costs are high, they require strong product prices to justify, and they're sensitive to oil and gas price fluctuations. Net present value, or NPV, is the sum of all discounted inflows and outflows related to a project. And NPV is important in oil and gas because generally the costs are paid mostly up front and the revenues are received over time, often over 20 years or more. The U.S. is an exception, though, in that about 70% of the onshore mineral rights are privately owned. In the United States, the most common method used by oil and gas companies to acquire mineral rights from mineral rights owners is using an instrument called an oil and gas lease. There are several common differences between international contracts and U.S. leases. And these differences can significantly impact the economics of a project. For example, there may be bonuses due at multiple stages. There's almost always a minimum work commitment, and this generally involves agreeing to shoot a certain amount of seismic and drill a certain number of wells. Now that we've discussed mineral rights, we know that there are at least a couple of changes that we need to make to our prospect economic evaluation. One of them is that we need to add in at least one bonus payment up front.
Another is that we need to factor in some form of royalty or production sharing, because while we know that we're going to pay all cost, we also know that we're not going to get all the revenues. Now let's talk about exploration risk and opportunities. There are different ways to categorize these risks, but we'll use four categories. The first category we'll call technical and geological risk. The next category we'll call execution risk. The next category we'll call market risk. And the next category we'll call political risk. Click on each category if you'd like to learn more. What this example shows is that if we spent $10 million drilling the exploration well, then statistically we could expect a $7 million gain in value, meaning we covered the well cost and generated $7 million of additional value. However, this is just a statistical value, and within that value we're projecting that there's a 60% chance that we'll lose money on the well, but there's a 40% chance that we'll make a substantial profit. Companies also commonly involve partners. This reduces the size of their investment in a project, which also helps them diversify because it gives them more opportunities to spread around their money. The intersection of these two subsets represents areas where you think you could make a profit and you can gain access to try. However, you also have to consider risk factors. Let's take a look at the Bighorn Basin. The basin is surrounded on all sides by mountain ranges. It's about 120 miles long and about 90 miles wide. And the surface elevation ranges from 4,000 to 6,000 feet above sea level. What we'll find is that there are actually two separate petroleum systems in the Bighorn Basin. One of them is younger from the Cretaceous period, approximately 100 million years ago. And the other one is older from the Permian period, approximately 250 million years ago. The Bighorn Basin has excellent outcrop exposure. In fact, every rock layer in the basin is exposed somewhere at the surface. This may seem impossible because you may be thinking of the rock layers as being thick, like a stack of pancakes. But really, on a basin scale, they're more thin, like a stack of crepes. The basin is 120 miles long and 90 miles wide, but the sedimentary rocks are only 5 miles thick at the very thickest part. If we go to the other side, you can see one of the most unique views in the entire Bighorn Basin. Here we have older rock exposed due to the thrust fault, but additionally we have a cut through those rock layers by a river valley, and down at the bottom of the cliff face, the oldest rock in the Bighorn Basin is exposed, the two and a half billion year old granite basement rock. This is the only place on the basin floor where this rock can be seen. In this area, there are exposed rock layer outcrops ranging all the way from the basement rock to the early Cretaceous period. On the left is a stratigraphic chart showing the rock layers exposed in this area. You can click on layers and see the locations of the outcrops. Also, you can click on the rock type legend on the left and see which layers are composed of those rock types. Matching rock layers from different locations based solely on their appearance and characteristics can have limitations. For example, rocks in one area may look the same as rocks in another area, but in fact, they may be from different layers and of different ages. For this reason, biostratigraphy is also used. Biostratigraphy involves identifying fossils contained within the rock layers to ensure they're the same layers. These fossils can also provide useful information about the rocks. Use of remote sensing data has several advantages. It can provide information over a broad area at a low cost. Certain types of information are already available for many locations around the globe. You can collect information well beyond what is visible to the human eye. And the data is collected in a digital format so that it can be computer processed for a variety of applications. 
This is a topographical map that shows surface features, and it also includes contour lines so that you can better understand those features. We'll zoom in for a closer look. Elevation data can also be used to create a 3D elevation model, which makes it very easy to observe the contour of the terrain. The sun emits a much broader spectrum of radiation than we can see. The portion that we can see we call visible light. However, there are also shorter waves such as ultraviolet and longer waves such as infrared and microwave. And satellites can detect these additional rays and the information can be converted into a format that we can observe. And some surface features can be better observed in these other spectrum. And so by using this information called multispectral data, we can better detect features on the Earth's surface. Two other types of low-cost, broad area tools that are often used during the frontier exploration phase include gravity and magnetic surveys. Magnetic readings are easier to take than gravity readings because magnetic recorders are less sensitive to motion. Thus, while most gravity readings are taken from various points on the surface, Magnetic readings can be taken continuously from moving aircraft or ships, and these aircraft or ships run data collection patterns in order to gather information over a wide area. We've been discussing the Bighorn Basin, and we've been discussing methods and tools that can be used to identify the boundaries and structure of sedimentary basins. So let's take a look at what there is to learn about the structure of the Bighorn Basin. We'll begin by taking a look at a cross-section or side view near the middle of the basin. The area above the dotted line represents sedimentary rock. Let's begin by discussing seismic waves and how they travel. Here's an animation of the seismic wave movements from an earthquake that happened in Nepal in 2015, and it's similar to many other earthquakes that have occurred. And some of the waves move across the surface, and they're called surface waves, and they're shown here in yellow. Other waves travel through the subsurface, and they're called body waves, and there are two types of body waves, called P waves and S waves, and we'll discuss them more later. As each molecule is pushed, it becomes compressed against the molecules further beyond, which in turn causes them to move, and the sequence propagates the wave forward. A wave of compression moves across the struck ball from right to left, forcing it to move left. Because the balls are closely arranged, though, that ball moves only slightly before colliding with the ball on its left. The energy is transferred at that point and continues to move across the balls in a chain reaction. One type is pressure waves, or P waves, and P waves essentially push their way through the subsurface. Another type is shear waves, or S waves, and S waves essentially shake their way through the subsurface. And notice how the girl's hair is both pushed and pulled as the air compresses and decompresses. P waves travel through rock by moving particles within the rock. Rock particles put up some resistance to movement, and that resistance, called acoustic impedance, varies depending on the rock characteristics. If there were multiple types of rock on the rail, and each type had a substantially different acoustic impedance, then the wave patterns would be disrupted at each interface and a small portion of the wave energy would reflect back toward the source. When you're ready to conduct the survey, you set up seismic receivers called geophones. You generate artificial seismic waves. You detect and record reflections that arrive back at the surface, and you process the data to generate useful seismic results. When the ground moves up and down, the magnet moves up and down inside the coil, 
because the magnet is attached to the element housing, which is firmly secured inside the geofoam case, which is installed in the ground. They create seismic signals by pressing a base plate against the ground using the suspended weight of the truck. The trucks then vibrate the plates up and down in patterns called chirps or sweeps, and these sweeps usually last several seconds. The block of seismic created from a 3D survey can be viewed from any angle or cross-section in order to better evaluate an area. 3D seismic costs more than 2D seismic, so it's primarily used in areas that are considered to have high potential. If you would like to explore this 3D survey on your own, click on the Explore button. Otherwise, click on Next to continue. The total length of the streamers is commonly 3 to 8 kilometers or about 2 to 5 miles long, but they can be up to 12 kilometers or about 7 miles long. In 2D seismic, only one streamer is towed, but in 3D seismic, several streamers are towed. A seismic vessel moves at about 10 kilometers per hour or 6 miles per hour while surveying. The vessels travel precisely planned sail lines that are usually arranged in a shifting oval pattern which is often equated to the shape of a racetrack. If you would like to explore a seismic vessel, click on the Seismic Vessel button. Otherwise, click on Next to continue on. The arrival of those reflections at each geophone are recorded on a timeline relative to the timing of the source. Each reflection is recorded as a wavelet and the amount of time between the source and the arrival of the wavelet represents the two-way travel time from surface source to subsurface reflection point to surface receiver. And frequency is the number of waves that could pass in a second if repeated constantly without gaps. A geophone at the surface can either be pushed up and then pulled down by a seismic reflection, or can be pulled down and then pushed up. Accordingly, the wavelet will show either compression first or rarefaction first. Refraction happens with waves traveling down and with reflected waves traveling back upward. Everyone has observed the principle of refraction in real life. Here's an example of refraction demonstrated by a laser beam being directed into a tank of water. Here's an example of a land seismic shot gather. In the middle at the top is the seismic source. The vertical lines represent traces from receivers placed at regular distances on both sides of the source. The signal to noise ratio for the common midpoint is improved substantially by the stack. All of that just provides data for a single midpoint on a single layer. However, the process is repeated for all midpoints across the layer and is then repeated for additional layers providing a clearer, higher resolution image. Then you can match log data with seismic data to identify individual known layers and to precisely determine their depth and thickness at the control points. These control points, combined with seismic, allow you to better interpret the seismic in areas between the control points. Here's a shot gather from a simple 2D marine seismic survey. In this survey is 3.3 kilometers long, which is about 2 miles, and it has 120 hydrophone channels with multiple hydrophones in each channel. Here's the final image after migration adjustments to reduce multiple reflections and to correct for dipping layers. We'll discuss this image further when we cover seismic interpretation. The image contains some prominent geological features, but those features can be difficult to discern with an untrained eye. An experienced geoscientist would notice that there are two broadly distinct elements in the image. There's been quite a bit of seismic shot in that northern area, and the seismic image that you saw is from the area indicated by the thick yellow line. About 30 million years ago, tectonic forces caused the fault block to tilt. 
Sediments continued to cover the area, and the area now lies in shallow water on the west side of North Island. There could potentially be fault traps against the thrust faults or the normal faults if oil and gas migrated into those layers and encountered an impermeable blockage on the other side of the fault. If you would like to see seismic images highlighting certain trap types, click on the images below. Otherwise, click Next to continue.